We're in Moscow tonight. We're here to interview the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin. Almost three years ago, the Biden administration illegally spied on our text messages and then leaked the contents to their servants in the news media. They did this in order to stop a Putin interview that we were planning. Last month, we're pretty certain they did exactly the same thing once again. But this time, we came to Moscow and here's why we're doing it. First, because it's our job. We're in journalism. Our duty is to inform people. Two years into a war that's reshaping the entire world, most Americans are not informed. For example, since the day the war in Ukraine began, American media outlets have spoken to scores of people from Ukraine, and they've done scores of interviews with Ukrainian President Zelensky. We ourselves have put in a request for an interview with Zelensky, and we hope he accepts. But the interviews he's already done in the United States are not traditional interviews. They are fawning pep sessions, specifically designed to amplify Zelensky's demand that the U.S. enter more deeply into a war in Eastern Europe and pay for it. That is not journalism. It is government propaganda. Propaganda of the ugliest kind, the kind that kills people. At the same time, our politicians and media outlets have been doing this, promoting a foreign leader like he's a new consumer brand. Not a single Western journalist has bothered to interview the president of the other country involved in this conflict, Vladimir Putin. Most Americans have no idea why Putin invaded Ukraine or what his goals are now. They've never heard his voice. That's wrong. Americans have a right to know all they can about a war they're implicated in. And we have the right to tell them about it because we are Americans. The following is an interview with the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, shot February 6, 2024 at about 7 p.m. in the building behind us, which is, of course, the Kremlin. The interview, as you will see if you watch it, is primarily about the war in progress, the war in Ukraine, how it started, what's happening, and most pressingly, how it might end. Here it is. There are reports that Elon Musk has already had a chip implanted in the human brain in the USA. What do you think of that? Well, I think there's no stopping Elon Musk. He will do as he sees fit. <laughs> Nevertheless, you need to find some common ground with him, search for ways to persuade him. I think he's a smart person, I truly believe he is. So you need to reach an agreement with him because this process needs to be formalized and subjected to certain rules. One of uh, our senior United States senators from the state of New York, Chuck Schumer, said yesterday, I believe, that we have to continue to fund the Ukrainian effort <clears throat> or U.S. soldiers, citizens could wind up fighting there. How do you assess that? Well, if somebody has the desire to send regular troops, that would certainly bring humanity to the brink of very serious global conflict. This is obvious. Do the United States need this? What for? Thousands of miles away from your national territory. Don't you have anything better to do? You have issues on the border, issues with migration, issues with the national debt, more than $33 trillion. You have nothing better to do, so you should fight in Ukraine? Wouldn't it be better to negotiate with Russia, make an agreement, already understanding the situation that is developing today, realizing that Russia will fight for its interests to the end? So I just want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding what you're saying. I don't think that I am. I think you're saying you want a negotiated settlement to what's happening in Ukraine. <laughs> right. And we made it. We prepared the huge document in Istanbul that was initialed by the head of the Ukrainian delegation. He affixed his signature to some of the provisions, not to all of it. He put his signature and then he himself said, we were ready to sign it and the war would have been over long ago, 18 months ago. However, Prime Minister Johnson came, talked us out of it, and we missed that chance. Who blew up Nord Stream? <laughs> you for sure. I was busy that day. <laughs> Nate, it, do you have? Do you have? <laughs> uh, I did not blow up Nord Stream. Uh, <laughs> thank you, though. 
You personally may have an alibi, but the CIA has no such alibi. Do you have evidence that NATO or the CIA did it? You know, I won't get into details, but people always say in such cases, look for someone who is interested. But in this case, we should not only look for someone who is interested, but also for someone who has capabilities. I just got to ask you one last question, and that's about someone who's very famous in the United States, probably not here, Evan Gershkovitz, who's the Wall Street Journal reporter. <sighs> We have done so many gestures of goodwill out of decency that I think we have run out of them. We have never seen anyone reciprocate to us in a similar manner. However, in theory, we can say that we do not rule out that we can do that if our partners take reciprocal steps. I do not rule out that the person you refer to, Mr. Gershkovitz, may return to his motherland. By the end of the day, it does not make any sense to keep him in prison in Russia. We want the U.S. Special Services to think about how they can contribute to achieving the goals our Special Services are pursuing. We are ready to talk. Moreover, the talks are on their way. And there have been many successful examples of these talks crowned with success. Probably this is going to be crowned with success as well.